Good afternoon. I am Council Member Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, and welcome to our oversight hearing on domestic violence initiatives, indicators, and factors in New York City. Today, we ask what might seem like a simple question, but is, of course, much more layered. Are we meeting the need for uh, survivors of domestic violence in New York City? As violent crime rates continue to drop across the five boroughs each year, domestic violence remains stubbornly pervasive. Alarmingly, statistics reveal that domestic violence continues to assume a larger proportion of overall crime. Let me reword that, sorry. Um, alarmingly, statistics reveal that domestic violence assumes over time a larger proportion of overall crime and homicides in the city. In order to assess the city's ability to meet the need for domestic violence services, the council recently passed my legislation, Local Law 38 of 2019, which requires the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence, or end GBV, to submit an annual report detailing information on select program activities and initiatives. Earlier this month, NGBV published its first annual report for 2018 in compliance with Local Law 38. This report includes data on total clients served, type of utilization rates, legal services staff, language access, economic empowerment programming to address financial abuse, and other nuanced issues that accompany many domestic violence cases. My legislation also requires the New York City Police Department to report on indicators and factors of chronic domestic violence cases, which will provide us with a generalized context for NGBV's report. I'm deeply disappointed that the NYPD has yet to produce this data but I am assured that it will, it will be provided no later than July 5th. The data from both agencies matters. As more survivors courageously come forward to report abuse, we must make sure that the city is capturing the demand for services. The bottom line is making sure that there are appropriate resources so the city can implement the necessary strategies to end and confront, to confront and end this epidemic. NGBV's report provides us with a window to assess the city's resources, programs, and services. And there are some slides uh, up on the screen for people in, uh, who are here to look at for those of you uh, who are watching online, you'll have to um, go online to the City Council website for this hearing where the report will be posted. And of course, the commissioner, I'm sure, will say that the report is on her website as well. Today, we will review NGBV's portion of its annual report to better understand the services provided to survivors in New York City. It's critical that we understand how all survivors engage with systematic responses. How are the differing concerns of various populations taken into account? How are staff trained in trauma-informed practices? How can the city best collaborate with community-based providers to provide culturally competent and language appropriate services? And how are these efforts tracked? All of these inquiries lead us back to this hearing's overreaching question. Are we meeting the need for DV services in New York City? Domestic violence involves physical, emotional, mental, sexual, and financial terror. 
This violence can affect any New Yorker, but it also disproportionately harms our city's most vulnerable and marginalized populations, women, LGBTQI plus individuals, peoples, people of color, and low-income New Yorkers. And I am committed to addressing this issue. Again, I want to stress the importance of ensuring that we are meeting the needs of all survivors in New York City. I'm grateful that we are joined today by Cecile Noel, NGBV Commissioner, who is one of the city's best leaders on this issue. I'm also very pleased to have survivors and advocates from across the city here to testify. Thank you. Finally, today the committee will also hear pre-considered resolution co-sponsored by our newest council member, Farrah Lewis, and myself, which calls upon Congress to pass and the president to sign the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2019. As violence against women persists in 2019 and against trans women of color in particular, the federal government must be obligated to provide the solutions needed to end this crisis. Before we hear from the administration, I'd like to thank Ned Terrace, my legislative director, as well as the awesome committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney, uh, my amazing counsel, uh, General Counsel Chloe Rivera, the Legislative Policy Analyst, and Monica Peppel, the Financial Analyst. Finally, um, as committee members enter, they will be acknowledged as well. And with that, um, I turn it over to my General Counsel. Please raise your right hand. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions today? Yes, I do. Thank you. Oh, no. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Ready? Bless you. Bless you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Rosenthal and members of the City Council on Women and Gender Equity. I am Cecile Noel. Commissioner of the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about NGBV's 2018 Annual Report on Domestic Violence Initiatives, Indicators, and Factors. The Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV, which was relaunched and expanded in 2018 via Executive Order 36, develops policies, and programs, provides training, prevention education, and um, performs community outreach, and conducts research and evaluations, and operates the New York City Family Justice Centers. We collaborate with city agencies and community stakeholders to ensure access to inclusive services for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, including intimate partner violence and family violence, elder abuse, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. The office also operates the New York City Family Justice Centers, or FJCs, which are walk-in multi-service centers in each borough for survivors to access free, confidential services and support, key city agencies, community partners, civil legal services providers, and district attorney's offices are located on site at each FJC to make it easier for survivors to get help. FJCs welcome people of all incomes, ages, sexual orientations, gender identities, regardless of the language they speak or immigration status. Service delivery at the FJC is consistent with trauma-informed, client-centered approaches. On June 1, 2019, NGBV released the 2018 Annual Report on Domestic Violence Initiatives, Indicators, and Factors. In, in compliance with Local Law 38 of 2019, which reflects data from calendar year 2018 and is publicly available and accessible via our website, www.nycgov uh, forward slash NGBV and on open data. 
the 2018 annual report provides an overview of select programs, activities, initiatives under NGBV, including information about the contracted service providers at the FJC, the number of clients and services they access, the available programming at the at the FJCs, NGBV's outreach and training efforts, and the reports released by NGBV. The New York City Family Justice Centers, the largest network of FJCs in the country, provide a variety of services to survivors and their children through on-site community partners and other city agencies, including safety planning, crisis intervention, case management, mental health counseling, economic empowerment services, criminal justice and civil legal assistance, children's programming and counseling, wellness programming and other supportive services. Last year, the FJCs had over 65,000 client visits across the borough, serving over 25,000 unique clients. In 2018, 20,656 unique clients received safety planning services, which is, which is the most frequently accessed service across the five FJCs, followed by criminal justice services, uh, 14,292 unique clients, civil legal services, 7,112 unique clients, and counseling services, 6,277 6, unique clients. In addition to providing legal services and crisis-related services such as safety, planning, and counseling, the FJCs also have on-site supportive services and programming to assist with other client needs, including long-term assistance and planning. In 2018, 2,131 unique clients access economic empowerment services, which include financial literacy, entrepreneurship, information and assistance with applying for public benefits, housing education and assistance, computer skills training and job readiness. Just last week, NGBV announced the launch of a learning lab at the Manhattan Family Justice Center, a new state-of-the-art training facility that will be the site of economic empowerment programming for survivors of gender-based violence to help build long-term economic stability. On-site community partners and city agency partners provide direct services that are available at the FJC. The city holds contracts with some of the on-site community partners to deliver the following core services, screening and case management, immigration law, family law, housing, legal, and children's services. Other in-kind providers at the FJC may also deliver services in these core areas. In total, over 40 community-based organizations are on site at the five FJCs, in addition to a large network of off-site providers that the FJCs work closely with on, on a referral basis. The New York City Family Justice Centers are committed to providing language access to persons with limited English profici proficiency. Each, uh, uh, providers at each of the five FJCs deliver legal and non-legal services in many language, languages. Excuse me. And additionally, NGBV is able to accommodate requests for in-person or telephonic interpretation as needed and appropriate. Through the contract with a telephonic interpretation vendor, FJC clients have access to telephonic interpretation in over 200 languages. In 2018, a considerable number of contracted legal provider staff spoke a language in addition to, in, in addition to English. NGBV emphasizes the importance of language access to service providers at each of the five FJCs to ensure all clients are provided with an opportunity to access programs and services. NGBV is continually exploring ways to enhance service delivery at the FJCs, providing efficient and effective services to survivors in a collaborative and supportive environment. In the spring of 2016, NGBV launched a new policy and training institute. The institute includes a policy team, a training team, and the New York City Healthy Relationship Training Academy, the academy as we call it, and leads NGBV's training and prevention work. The Institute was created to enhance 
en enhance city agency and community-based organizations' responses to the issues of domestic and gender-based violence, identify key areas for policy change and development, and engage in primary prevention through work with young people throughout the city. In 2018, the training team conducted 321 trainings for city agency staff, not-for-profit staff, and community, me and community members to enhance, to enhance their engagement with and response to survivors of domestic and gender-based violence. In 2018, the Academy conducted 725 prevention-based healthy relationship uh, workshops and trainings with youth parents and professional staff in schools and community settings. NGBV will continue to build out our training topic areas and will explore new mechanisms to access our training and prevention programming. In addition to training, outreach is a key component to raising awareness about domestic and gender-based violence and connecting survivors to services. NGBV's outreach team focuses on broad outreach efforts across all five boroughs and works, collective and, and, and works collaboratively with elected officials, community members, and stake stakeholders, community-based organizations, and other city agencies to host and participate in events that build the capacity of local communities to prevent, recognize, and respond to domestic and gender-based violence. Outreach is done in communities across the city with special focus on immigrant, youth, vulnerable, and other traditionally underserved communities. Through a myriad of community partnerships and by facilitating conversations, art-based practices, and other methods of engagement, staff increase community awareness for domestic and gender-based violence and promote, and promote resources available to victims and survivors throughout New York City. In 2018, NGBV conducted 764 outreach events, including community events, community meetings, trainings, presentations, and other events. Most recently, NGBV launched a web-based toolkit for salon and barbershop professionals, and will be conducting outreach to local salons and barbershops to connect business owners, employees, and clients to information and resources. In addition to the two 2018 annual report we are discussing today, NGBV also releases periodic fact sheets and briefs about pertinent topics to inform New Yorkers about the issues related to domestic and gender-based violence, as well as to enhance access to data and NGBV program updates. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with the Council and our partner agencies and community partners to share information about NGBV's programs and initiatives. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to these issues, and I welcome any questions the committee may have. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I, I guess we can end because you answered all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> this was terrific testimony. It really does put it in good context, and I appreciate that. So thank you for your testimony, and we're going to um, look at it more closely. Please be patient with me if I ask you some questions sure. that you already answered um, in the testimony. Um, I think my first, and in fact, my first question is trying to get at um, how local law 38 can be meaningful and helpful. And I think one thing, you know, one glaring component part that's missing, which makes it hard for us to have this discussion, is of course the NYPD part. But um, in order, you know, as you clearly are addressing the broader needs um, of people, are there, um, and our goal is to reflect that work. Do you think that there are services available? I'm looking at your 2018 report right now. Um, uh, programs, you know, outreach to agencies, which you have information about, as I say. But do you think that there could be um, more information in that report that would help the agency and the public understand the needs of um, survivors. For example, um, identifying the 
demand for services by language. You know, how many people walk into the FJC speaking in Russian? Um, and which boroughs is that in? Your report lays out beautifully the number of staff provided by borough who speak the various languages. But for example, in Queens, it looks like there are five Spanish speakers, but we know there are nearly 200 languages spoken. Um, what is the demand by language spoken um, for services? I oh, think and um, hang on right before you s I apologize um, we're joined today by uh, Councilmember Ben Kalos from Manhattan who is a member of the committee welcome our report or the 2018 report that we are here to discuss really captures our contracted service providers our uh, the community-based service providers also come with additional capacities that are not that are um, not reflected there. What you have are contracted providers. And as I understand it and have seen myself, the other providers are perhaps funded through a different funding stream, city government funding stream. Um, but come to the Family Justice Centers sort of free, um, that they're available there to provide services even though it's not a direct contract the way you have direct contract with Safe Haven. Is that... Safe Horizon. Safe Horizon, thank Safe you. Horizon. Is that a fair way to characterize it? I would characterize it as we have a, a partnership a yeah. collaborative relationship. And so uh, our non-contracted partners are funded, as you said, through other sources. And they bring, uh, and, and through the Family Justice Center, yeah. they are able to get in-kind services from us. So they get an office and they get um, oh, right. um, sure. um, lots of in-kind services. So this is by no means just, I think you coined it as, as free in that way. I would coin it right. as much more. <laughs> right a collaborative, yes. mutually beneficial relationship. A thousand percent, I'm with you. But then what it, it strikes me then that this report doesn't reflect all of those amazing partnerships. Uh, it does not. Uh, we reported on the contracted providers as was indicated in the actual legislation. You, re right, a fair point. Yes, exactly, got it. Um, okay, excuse me for a minute. Um, so a couple of things, a and with the understanding that the report did not require this, uh, the law does not re require you to provide this information. So with that understanding in mind, could you provide to the committee a list of your community partners? Yes, we can. We can follow up with you. Great. With a list of that. And if you looked at the staff, um, and this isn't, again, this is, I don't mean to put you on the spot, so <laughs> this is something that I would expect you to get back. But if you looked at the staffing in each of the centers, what proportion do you think are provided by the contracted providers versus the collaboration providers? Um, so we ensure that every Family Justice Center has a robust core uh, complement of services. Of and course. those are our contracted services. And so the, the community-based providers that are non-contracted help enhance that. But we would be happy to get back to you with a breakdown of what that looks like between our contracted and non. Yeah. It's an amazing collaboration. What I'm getting at in my question is simply the report doesn't, our yeah. legally, what we asked for, we doesn't capture the full breadth of mm -hmm. the work that you're doing. And um, 
And that's important to know. And we c we're happy to follow up with you for the addition. And in many ways, it answers my question of, um, in looking at the report and looking at the number of clients versus the number of staff and seeing, you know, sort of saying, wow, that's a heck of a ca caseload. But that's not, in fact, true because there are other providers there. That is correct. Okay. That's really helpful to know. Thank you. And if we could work offline We'd be after happy this to hearing that. to get that yeah. information, it would be awfully helpful. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about the intake form that the Family Justice Center uses. Um, do you have a, or does Safe Horizons use a preliminary intake form? And is that form the same that's used at all the centers? We have a standard form across all the centers for screening and assessment. And is everyone asked to fill out that form first? Yes. In screening and intake? Yes. And so given the nearly 200 languages in Queens, how, how, what mechanism is used right at the beginning to Again, address? Um, as I said in my testimony, we use telephonic um, interpretation services. And we also, and Safe Horizon does have some capacity, language yep. capacity, yep. and that's also utilized as well. But we certainly use um, the interpretation services provided by the city. Now I'm forgetting if this is already in your report, but do you have the numbers on how often you use those services? We can get back to you with that. Is that something that is trackable? Yes. Great. And that would be interesting to know, mm -hmm. and then, if possible, to know by borough office. Okay. Um, that's great. Thank you. Um, oh, can I just say out loud how much I appreciate my staff? <laughs> um, I'm lucky, lucky to have this committee and amazing staff. Um, do you, the language um, line employees, are those city employees? Is that a city contract? It is a city contract. They are not city employees. They're right. contractor employees. Okay. And have they been trained in, you know, trauma-centric, sensitivity? Um, first of all, I just want to correct one thing. Our contract is with Voyance, not Language Line. What's it called? Voyance. V-O-Y-A-N-C-E. -E. Voyance, not Language Line. Okay. And uh, to every degree possible, we make sure that um, the contractor understands both the Family Justice Center and our issues. What does that mean? Uh, specifically, like so. So if there, we don't provide direct training to to these uh, to to voyance, But if issues come up that reflect um, any problem with the contractor, those are immediately addressed. How many times in the last year has there been an issue? We would have to get back to you. I I don't know that off the top. Is right. I mean, has there been one? I have to, I'd have to go get back to you. There are five family justice centers. We'd have to go back and look. That's, um, and we can get that information for you. I is just don't that have it noted? Hmm? That, that is yes. available? You yes. would have a notation that yes, there was a problem? Yes, we would. Okay. I mean, obviously, the reason I'm interested is, again, the goal of the hearing and uh, the oversight hearing is to ensure that you know, you're providing great services, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that you have all the tools necessary to get the work done right. for survivors. And so in this particular case, you know, in summary, we have this great tool. There are nearly 200 languages. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have staff available. So we, so the city uses a contract with, with voyance, mm -hmm. and, um, but given the inherently sensitive nature of this work um, and, and what we've learned about um, 
the implications for people who are not trained um, to for survivors. Mm -hmm. um, it would be in the interest of the committee or the council to understand how that's working out so we can under better understand perhaps there should be more preventative training um, for these workers. Don't, mm -hmm. don't, I'm just describing. No problem, and we're happy to get back to you with that information. We just don't have that available here today. Um, and I do want to emphasize that there is a language access coordinator that also addresses all of these issues, ensures that we're compliant with local law, is really looking at um, our usage as we track it and think about those things. So, um, and so we're happy to get back to you with that information. Thank you. And I'm sure that is there due to another local law that I should know, <laughs> but don't. Um, the language interpreter, is that for the mayor's office or out of DCAS? Mm -hmm. This is a DCAS contract, and, um, and it's a relatively new vendor for us, um, and we will get back to you. But I, I think anecdotally, just again, anecdotally, I think um, our FJCs have been very happy with the service and staff have been. But yep. we'll, we'll get back to you with yep. the exact numbers. I mean, I definitely get that sense. <coughs> if, mm -hmm. if there was a glaring problem, yeah. you would, I'm guessing, report on that. Um, in some fashion, so that's yes. helpful to know. Um, do you, I wanna get back to, then we got a little distracted by the language access forms, mm -hmm. but I'm um, by the uh, voyance um, services, but I'm wondering if you have a sense of how many people come to the center, perhaps with an unusual language and leave prior to filling out the intake form? Our commitment is to ensure that every um, person presented is seen and at least assessed in terms of their safety for that day and initial assessment. And so um, that's our commitment to everyone coming into our space. And that includes if we have to get someone on, on, on the um, the telephonic interpretation. Yeah, well, I'm just looking at the numbers. So 25, uh, over 25,000 people walked through the door. Unique clients, yes. Unique clients. And what I'm asking is, um, do we know if that is the total number who walk, I mean, or let me say it a different way. Can I assume that each of those 25,000 plus people filled out an intake form? Yes. And then are those forms, um, is the information from the forms implemented um, electronically, digitally, or are those um, pieces of paper that you have on file or perhaps upload, scan in? Um, it's completed um, on paper and then put into our database. Yep, okay. And I'm sure there are issues with privacy. I'm yes, not there are. trying to yes, there are. explain go down any one of those roads. Um, can you provide the committee with the intake form? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, do the forms collect demographic data? It's sort of by zip code or? Um, uh, Without seeing the form in front of me, I, I would need to, to look at that. But can we just get back to you on the a the thousand staff on percent? That? And the two okay. other questions that are going to be part of that, and okay. we can send you our questions. That would be fine. Um, is does the intake form allow a client to self-identify with regard to sexual orientation or gender, um, or is there boxes that you check, or is it true self-identification? And can you share aggregate data? Again, don't want to run into any issues with privacy concerns on who the FJC clients are, including age, language spoken, um, uh, self-identified gender orientation, and race, race self-identified race and ethnicity? Yes. Okay. And 
again, we will get this information when we see it, but I'm wondering if the FJCs collect any other sort of, you know, basic data like that um, as a way to um, see what's going on. Oh, we're going to get that when we see the questionnaire. You don't have to answer that. Um, I want to Um, could you describe um, the partnerships or other collaborative relationships that you have with other city agencies? We have um, collaborative relationships with off-site partners. So it's, it's quite possible that someone can come into our FJC and um, upon initial assessment of services and everything else, we determine or the client really feels better accessing the services with a community partner in their own community. And so we have off-site relationships and we make those referrals and we follow up on those referrals. I was, I, I gotcha, and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's helpful to know because um, I think that gets to cultural um, competency. But I was really asking about city agencies. Mm -hmm. For example, ACS. You could imagine a mm -hmm. situation where a survivor of domestic violence is having an issue um, with their children being taken away from them or not. Okay. On site at the FJC, we have HRA on site to okay. help with public benefits. We have N NYPD on site to help uh, both if someone needs to make a police report, if we have a high risk case that they need to follow up on. So those two providers are definitely on site. And again, we're co-located with the district attorney's office. So should we need to follow up with something on the criminal justice side, that's quite possible. So in addition to that, part of our role is to have a collaborative as well as coordinating relationship with other city agencies. So we work closely with ACS yep. on cases that yep. might come up. We work closely with ACS on training initiatives to ensure that caseworkers are, are getting training in domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Uh, since our expansion, we've been working closely with their uh, um, child trafficking unit or anti-trafficking unit in ACS, thinking about um, the continuum of services. Unfortunately, in trafficking, uh, sometimes that begins really early and then goes into adulthood and how can we work together in that space um, um, much more. So we're working across agencies. We work with the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice on issues. So we, we, we are definitely collaborating and working with city partners on many issues and we do have a number of city partners that are actually in um, the FJC. So, and if I'm looking at the report, you report on um, healthy relationship, the Healthy Relationship Training Academy. Yes. Is that where I would find um, training of uh, city agency staff? Uh, you would find training of city agency staff under our policy and training unit, right? Which includes the, the Healthy Relationship Academy, but we've trained 189, um, we've had 189 training for city agency staff. Oh, I see, at the training agency. Yes. Could you provide information on the um, agencies that are included? Yes. While this is not directly related to domestic violence, I was in a, um, a task force meeting the other day on um, female genital mutilation, cutting, and a concern was raised that ACS workers are not familiar with that practice. Mm -hmm. And so when they see it, they may have an inappropriate reaction. Is that something that um, your office trains about? Yes. 
it is something that we train about. Since our expanded mission, we have been working with the coalition to end FGMC. And we actually hosted uh, one of the original, or the first meeting at one of the FJCs. We've been training both with community partners, and we have also um, held listening sessions with uh, community providers who work in this area to understand both this, the scope of the issue and how we as a city can really think about um, our response and ensuring that we are in fact um, responding in the best and most comprehensive way. And I see your staff is eagerly providing additional information about that, and I appreciate it. Could we, after this hearing, provide that information to the council about, you know, I'm assuming it's going to be, you know, how many trainings around this, what agencies are trained, the community partners, the task okay. force, um, whatever it is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. Is there, um, uh, what is the relationship between the, um, um, or, or what's the relationship or what's the difference in a way between an FJC direct employee and an FJC contracted employee? An FJC direct employee. So are there any direct employees? We have administrative staff that Got are. It. So I want to just clarify, this, the administrative staff are NGBV staff. Right. Got so it. Uh, the staff who oversee the, the centers, each of the centers, ensure the centers are opened on time every morning, that everyone's there, all of the administrative functions as well as the coordination within that space of services and providers and troubleshooting any issue really are um, done by NGBV staff who are the administrative arm for each of the FJCs. Great. Is that reported in the annual report? No. Okay. Is that something we could get information about? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, do you have any other direct staff? Contracted staff, our staff, any kind. Okay, great. Um, one of the things, the reason I ask, and one of the things that I've been trying to wrap my head around is working with OMB um, to provide us with a clear um, under, understanding or you know spending level across city agencies for um, your office. Is that something you can help us with? At this point, um, I believe there has been an agreement with OMB to provide that information for FY 2021. Um, and I believe that the request is in to look at the wider city spending as well. OK, that is great to know. Um, thank you. Hang on one second, sorry. One of the, um, in looking at your report, mm -hmm. the section on economic empowerment programs and what's provided at each of the borough offices, mm -hmm. um, we'd like to get at, you know, is, uh, are, are we meeting demand? And trying to understand that. So, wondering like with your um, uh, collaborative partners mm -hmm. who, who I'm guessing provide these trainings, mm -hmm. how often they come? Is it once a month, um, once a week? Are they there permanently? Like what, what, um, what is being provided? 
compared to demand. Okay, so uh, there are two questions in there. So you ask how often. That will bear, vary by center and program. So how often? It could be once a month. It could be once every week. If you look at um, uh, one of our economic, the sanctuary program, they're there every day um, in terms of doing that work because that's what the program really requires. So that the, the, the expectation or the programming and, and the amount of times that they're there will really vary across the programming. Um, And, and these programs are brought, brought to us, they seek their own independent funding and really bring the programming, yeah. the programming there, so. No, that's, it, it's part of the whole collaboration, mm -hmm. which is amazing. So when on the economic um, empowerment mm -hmm. side, when you provide the list of um, the CBOs mm -hmm. that are doing that work, right. if you could indicate what boroughs they're in and how often they provide that service, and I imagine, so in my mind's eye, what I'm seeing is the, um, you have determined eight categories of empowerment programs, which is fantastic. So um, in each of the categories, my guess is there might be different providers mm -hmm. and they might be coming in different days of the week. Yes. So in my mind's eye, that's how I'm envisioning a chart. Okay, all right, so we'll absolutely look at this and get back to you. Okay, and then how do we get at this issue of space, um, physical space, and whether or not there's enough physical space to have all of your partner workers there, um, manage all the clients successfully, <coughs> is that, um, you know, when we were looking at the NYPD, SVD, for example, we could see, as we visited the different borough offices, real differences in uh, physical space. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts about the five boroughs and where you might have, um, where you're a little more tight? You know, I think, from a city perspective, I, I, I don't think you can talk to an agency that doesn't say that uh, space is tight. So I think just as a general rule, um, we, we as the city are always um, thinking about looking at and considering um, what that space need is and DCAST as a partner is always working with us to really yeah. entertain that. But let me just say that for each of the, each of the family justice centers definitely have a different footprint in terms of their yeah. space. And our staff, the administrative staff, actually do a, a just an outstanding job in managing that space and continually evaluating what's needed and how do we and how do we ensure that we are really providing the right services at the right time for the clients that we're seeing, and that changes over time. Um, so that we are always looking at our on-site providers and trying to maximize in every way possible the service delivery that they bring, and that's a constant reevaluation. So five years ago, X agency might have been a wonderful partner, but we're not seeing any referrals right now. How can we maximize that by maybe shifting that partner to an off-site partner and bringing on a partner that we actually need? So we're always looking at that, and I think that ensures that we're making the best use of the space that we do have and managing it well. So again, it begs the question, if you could provide by borough the um, on-site providers and the off-site sure. CBOs, um, that would be yes. helpful. And then if you could, um, So the way you manage demand, would it be fair to say that the way you manage demand and capacity um, is capturing spillover with your partner um, CBOs? A spillover demand, um, I think that we work collaboratively to ensure that everyone coming in is addressed. And when, and when there's a need for a survivor who chooses to see someone off-site, then we make that possible as well. If you were to pick one 
borough where you could increase the size of the FJC, what would it be? I think we'd, we'd um, in an ideal world, everyone wants a great deal of space, and I think that we do a great job of maximizing what we have. I've, I've seen the Staten Island one we visited together. Mm -hmm. That was tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you're doing some work in the Manhattan one. Mm -hmm. I was thinking you were going to say Queens, only because of the size of the borough and, and the different demands. We have a robust team in Queens, and we're doing a great job managing that space. Okay. Um, I just want to mention that we've been joined by Council Member Ayala from the from East Harlem and Central Bronx, um, Southern Bronx. And we welcome her. When you're ready for questions, let us know. Um, okay. Can you um, differentiate in your report or separately um, the uh, difference between an economic empowerment program versus a workforce training program? As part of our follow-up, we yeah. can certainly do that, yes. Okay. I mean, do you see it do you is that part of your I think I think there's some programs that involve both right um, mm -hmm. uh, if you were to take let's say the economic empowerment program at sanctuary they're probably doing both right and exactly and so um, th that exact program is listed as being provided in Manhattan and Brooklyn. It serves all of the family justice centers. We just have the space in Manhattan that's the designated training space, but recruitment happens across all five boroughs. And would it make sense to replicate the program in Queens or the Bronx? Um, again, Sanctuary, uh, the provider, brings that program to us. They make the determination based on capacity, funding, and all kinds of issues where that where this program would um, be most effective given all of the variables that they actually work with as well. Um, last year, NGBV received $3.3 in new funding to be allocated to the Family Justice Centers to increase mental health services for DV survivors um, using psychotherapy and psychiatric methods in a holistic approach to trauma. Mm -hmm. Do you know, um, could you articulate which of those services um, might overlap with the services highlighted in your report? Um, the, the mental health program that's referenced there is a collaboration that we have with H&H, &H and it's very specific to um, um, a psychiatric provider that's hired by H&H, &H, um, um, psychotherapist and psychiatrist, and that program is what's highlighted there separate and apart, but it lives within our family justice centers and clearly takes referrals if needed from other providers as well as external domestic violence providers who might need the service. So that's one of the CBOs that'll be listed Not as... Not a CBO, it's H&H, &H, Health and Hospitals. But they're contracting with someone. That's health why I said it. Health and Hospitals directly delivers that service okay. for us. So they have staff. They hire a psychiatrist, psychotherapist... Got it. ...to be on staff with us. All right. So could you identify how many of those staff are at each of the FJCs separately? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and was that ongoing funding baseline? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just want to make sure I'm reading the data right on the report. And I'm going to go back to the first page where you have clients versus client visits versus mm -hmm. unique clients. Mm -hmm. It implies 
Um, if we could go back, oh, there, to this one. If that's there. Oh, okay. Uh, so the total of unique clients is over 25,000, and the total for client visits is 65,000. Um, is it, I'm trying to interpret it. Is it fair to say every client visits 2.5 times or? Um, it's fair to say that clients are engaged in our services and come back multiple times from multiple services. On average, each client engages in, in like five different services in our family justice centers. So they're coming back oh. and they're okay. actually engaging in these services. So what does client visits mean? It's actually the number of times that a client comes into our centers. So it's, so it's the amount of times that the client comes into our center. I see. So if each client is on average using five services, they might use two services or three services at the next visit. And that's why it's not reflected right. in visits. Right. And that answers the question for the next page, for your next chart, which is number of unique clients by service type utilized. Mm -hmm. That number adds up larger. to 56, 57,000. Yeah. much larger. That's right. Because you're, you're engaging in more than one service. And that could happen at one visit, as you said so well. I, I have a legal appointment, and I'm going to see a case manager. But then wouldn't you assume that the number of services provider would be higher than the number of client visits? You're, you're breaking that. It's utilized by unique client type, I think, in the bottom. So the unique clients. These are the unique clients in the bottom. So it's really over the 25,000. So these are unique clients, not the total visit. The bottom chart is unique clients. But then not it would add visits. up to 25,000. If it was unique clients, it adds up to 56,733. A unique client may access more than one type of service. A unique client may access more than Absolutely. one Absolutely. So let's say you you use three services on your first visit, mm -hmm. two services on your second visit. That would be two visits, five mm -hmm. services. Right. And so, which is how I would imagine mm -hmm. it works. Mm -hmm. I, that's why I was wondering why if you add up all the services utilized, mm -hmm. it comes to 56,700 and change compared to the number of visits, 65,855. My guess, the answer to that question is, people are so busy doing the job of meeting the needs of the clients, they may not be checking all the boxes, um, but help me if I'm misunderstanding we try, we, we the chart. We try to ensure that we're collecting the data um, simply as robust as possible. Sure, so, sure. So, so the administrators really look out for that. But it's not, it really is the one-to-one -one match, and I think that's what we're trying to do with this. Um, they're, accessing, they're accessing more than one service, and these are unique clients accessing those services. So, and the visits are just how many times you come in for a particular service. I'm gonna let it go, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure I understand the chart okay. then. Okay. Um, maybe we'll talk offline about it. We were just looking across time mm -hmm. at the number of um, outreach events. And it seemed like, if I'm recalling correctly, two years ago, the number was higher than one year ago. And then it's bounced back up again a little bit. But why was there that big drop? Um, staffing factors. Um, just attrition in staff and the time it takes to hire new staff and get them trained and on board. 
was just in a, a, a staffing. Got it. That's fine. But is it, I thought that, um, so with, oh, so your staff not only administers the program at each of the FJCs, it's your direct staff who does the outreach to other agencies or other providers. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. got it, got it. So that was literally staffing. But are you budgeted um, for enough? How many vacancies does your, agent, your office currently have? We would have to go back and get you that information. Um, but um, we are budgeted for staff to do outreach in the community. Uh, much like our training staff, we're budgeted for that as well. That's our staff as well doing the training. What's your total number of FTEs for your office? We can get back to you with that. We, and because we've had attrition and vacancies, so I want to tell you what the number is as of whatever. Sure, training. sure. I guess, I mean, if, we're gonna get, if you're going to get back to me, what mm -hmm. I would want to know exactly is, for the last two fiscal years, what was your budgeted number and what was your actual number um, for each year? And then for this year, what's your budgeted number? And okay. if you can do that separated out by training folks versus FJC administrative folks versus anything else okay. that is appropriate, that would be super helpful. Okay, okay great, thank you. We've hit a lot of our questions. Hang on one second. Do you provide services and, or does one of your CBOs provide services and, or programming for the perpetrators of domestic based violence? Um, in, the, in the community or the community, community-based providers offer that service as service is not in the FJC. Okay. So you're not, you don't have a contract no, with? No, we do not. Okay. But does each FJC like have a list of those CBOs? Centrally we do and, C and, and the FJCs have it as well. Okay. Could you include that in the information? And maybe if you have it, the demand, that how often do people ask? That we do not have. Okay, all right. Um, thank you. In your database, I want to get at the issue of unique clients mm -hmm. for one second. Um, if someone visits a Manhattan FJC and also a Queens FJC, are they counted as one person or two unique That's clients? That, honestly, I will have to get back to you on, on that one. Great. That would be really interesting to know. It gets mm -hmm. at the question mm -hmm. of whether or not the databases you have, which are completely private, and secure and would never be forward facing, but that it captures yes. somebody who's using duplicative centers and just in order to track them holistically um, for their case managers. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Oh, sure, Councilmember Ayala. Hi, Commissioner. I'm sorry I was late. We're running around from hearing to hearing this morning. Um, I, I just had a question regarding the, the Justice Center. Uh, the, what, do you know what the average, and you have already responded to this, my apologies, what the average number of individuals being serviced at each center is per year? 
Um, we have over 25,000 unique clients across the five family justice centers. Oh, that's across all four? All, all five. five. That's annual? Yes. Okay. Um, do you track how many of the 2,500? Uh, thousand. Thousand, sorry. Of the 25,000 are coming from referrals from district attorney's offices, from the uh, the hospitals, how many are walk-ins, how many are referred from NYPD? Is there a tracking, me a tracking mechanism? Mm -hmm. I, we don't we don't really track referrals in that way um, we certainly have an array of services and in a client-centered model we are really being directed by what the client is presenting and seeking at that moment and they may not always tell us that they were referred from here or there so um, I mean, no is there are we keeping that yeah. information no the reason that I ask is because I've been to the one in the Bronx I haven't yet been to the mm -hmm. one in Manhattan and I was floored by the number but the, the resources that you're offering there. And if I was a person seeking those services, you know, I would be ecstatic to find all of them under one roof. And I just wonder if, you know, the, if, a, if a, just a regular person, you know, that may be at home and may not be connected to services, uh, how is that, per how are we getting to that person? How does, she, how does she or he know this is where I need to be, right? Um, if you're referred by NYPD or if you're referred by the district attorney's office, that's easy, right? But if we don't know how many are actually walking in because they heard about it, you know, in the radio or they saw an ad, you know, in the subway, then, you know, it'll kind of help us better uh, service our constituents if we knew that they were being referred as opposed to they actually just ran into the information because we're doing such a great job you know, in, in our uh, outreach campaign? Um, well, clearly, if the district attorney or NYPD, they are referring to us, NYPD, even, um, even the uniform responses will carry cards for the FJC. Um, we also do extensive outreach in communities. That's where we're working. We're working to help folks uh, really understand the services there and connect in every way possible. So we are always seeking new partnerships, new opportunities. If you know of any, please let us know to be able to go out there and really inform communities and let them know uh, the center is there, the services are available. I'm and always as, available. As well as um, we work with healthcare providers yeah. to, to ensure that they're aware as well. No, I'm, I'm listen, I'm your number one fan. <laughs> um, however, I do believe that a tracking mechanism is really um, essential because it'll it'll guide us, right? It'll help. It's a, it's a guiding tool. It'll tell us, you know, this is where the bulk of our constituents are coming from, right? And this is where we need to maybe do a little bit better. So I would strongly urge, you know, some consideration to some sort of, of mechanism that allows us to, to better gauge that. And we'll certainly consider. Thank you we'll so much. That. Thank you, Council Member. We hadn't addressed that at all. So oh, thank you. That. Wouldn't have even thought of it, so thank you. Um, and Commissioner, you mentioned that the, uh, did you, did I hear you just say that the NYPD police officers carry? Uh, they have our, our, our POM cards. Yeah. Um, and those are the DVPOs and they, uh, they. The DVPOs DVPO, carry them, right. got it. Um, and then, <coughs> Lastly, I want to ask about the sensitivities around undocumented individuals uh, coming to the FJCs. Um, how is that addressed when someone walks in and it's noted that they're uh, an undocumented individual? How is that person, that information about that person handled? Again, um, we work from a trauma-informed, client-centered model. So we are sure, being sure. directed by the survivor in a lot of our work. We understand um, many of the issues that undocumented clients face. Um, one, we want to ensure that we're communicating in the appropriate language. That's the first thing. And so, again, I spoke about our telephonic interpretation services that were there. We are also trying to make sure that Clients, where possible, if they're not comfortable, if, if they would like to be connected to a provider in the community that they feel is closer to home, 
um, better for them to access that. We are supporting that in every way possible. We have expanded our immigration legal services to be in communities with organizations that are not normally DV organizations yeah. to embed um, both DV immigration legal in those agencies to make our response much more robust for, uh, for undocumented clients who may not want to come into a family justice center. But we are also working closely with our, our, our community partners because they're the strongest voice, right? Yeah. They're the strongest voice in validating the work that happens in the FJC and even accompanying um, someone if they need to come. Have you ever had an incident where ICE uh, was waiting outside the door or has come in? No, and we don't ask anything about immigration status. Okay. So we do not ask, um, unless it's related, as I said, it yeah. could be related sure, sure. to immigration services. I was wondering. Applying. Um, so we do not ask. Okay. Hang on. I think that's it. Thank okay. you so much for your time. Thank, thank you to you. your staff, thank you. the amazing work that your office does. Thank you. Really, I, you know, we're all fans. Um, we just want to make sure you have all the resources thank you me. need. We really um, appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. And if someone, though, from your staff could stay to hear yes. the someone comments from the advocates and survivors. Absolutely. Someone will Great. be here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to call up the next panel. I'm calling up Sarah Hayes from Sanctuary for Families, Andrew Santa Anna from Day One, and um, Rye Walker from Girls for Gender Equity. Um, Ms. Hayes from Sanctuary for Families could kick it off. Certainly. That would be great. Thank, Thank you for coming. And we're going to, should we have a three-minute talk? Or? If you could try not to have a 20-minute presentation <laughs> and keep it around three minutes, that'd be helpful. But I'm not going to start the clock yet. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Hayes, Deputy Director of the Economic Empowerment Program at Sanctuary for Families. New York City's largest provider of services exclusively for survivors of domestic violence and other forms of gender-based violence. We are so grateful to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity and its chair, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, for the opportunity to speak today. We deeply appreciate the Council's strong efforts to support gender-based violence survivors and to better understand the range of issues that confront them. Sanctuary has worked in close partnership with the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, NGBV, since that office was established nearly two decades ago as a key community partner providing services at the New York City Family Justice Centers, FJCs, since the first center was launched in Brooklyn in 2005. Sanctuary has a strong presence in all the FJCs, with 44 full-time staff based out of the Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, and Queens FJCs, and a monthly rotation of family law attorneys at the Staten Island FJC. Sanctuary is contracted to provide FJC family law legal services and children's services through grants administered by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and provides counseling, case management, family law, and economic stability services through a non-residential services grant through DHF, DHS HRA. Immigration legal services in Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx are supported through a long-standing grant from the Robin Hood Foundation and leveraging of city council funds. We also offer our intensive four-month career readiness training program in a beautiful, recently completed 25-seat learning lab at the Manhattan FJC 
the construction of which we are deeply grateful to the city for financing and executing in full. Here, I want to directly acknowledge NGBV Commissioner Cecile Noel for her tireless advocacy in getting this center completed. Her vision helped ensure that every detail of the learning lab was executed in the most high quality, intentional way to invoke to evoke the dignity and empowerment that the abuse survivors who will use it in the years to come need and deserve. Um, Ms. Hayes, yes. I, I'm looking at your testimony. Yes. Um, is there some way you could pick out the choice paragraphs and read those? All of it will be submitted for the record. Um, but if there's anything in particular that you would want us to know in order to um, Certain. reflect something. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, here it's important to differentiate between uh, uh, two vital um, but often inaccurately conflated areas of need for our survivors of violence in the city, um, economic stability and economic empowerment. Sanctuary addresses both areas, looking at our clients' needs as part of a continuum um, from immediate safety and survival to stability um, to long-term self-sufficiency and freedom from violence. Our economic stability specialists, as well as family, immigration, housing, and public benefits attorneys work with clients on a range of needs that help them achieve stability in the wake of violence, um, obtaining and maintaining public benefits, finding affordable housing with subsidies where available, securing child and spousal support, and obtaining other income and material support such as emergency cash, food, and clothing. By contrast, our economic empowerment program and programs like it focus on preparing um, abuse survivors to enter and thrive in the city's service sector economy. EEP's goal is to impart the skills and experience participants need to meet this job marketplace on its own terms and find career track jobs and ultimately cycle off public benefits for good. Sanctuary delivers EEP signature four month career training program to 150 to 180 survivors annually, an increase of over 50 percent um, from previous capacity thanks to the opening of the MFJC Learning Lab last year. Graduates obtain nationally recognized certification in Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Outlook, as well as enhanced literacy skills and extensive professional development. The program has a strong emphasis on social justice and belief system development. Um, the pr uh, sorry, for, for, for participants, belief um, specifically in self and the belief that they have a place in the city's robust 21st century economy. Their outcome, um, our outcomes are extraordinary. More than 950 clients have been trained and 450 placed in jobs since the program began in 2011. Um, since January 2019, EEP has placed 60 graduates in jobs with starting wages averaging over $20 per hour. Seven clients have been hired as administrative staff um, at J.P. Morgan Chase at salaries of $60,000 to $70,000 annually, and many more at Wilmer Hale, Goldman Sachs, and other major firms. There are even several EEP graduates interning at this city council. Um, but programs like this are inherently intensive. Meaningful career training cannot be fast-tracked in a few hours a day over, or over a week or two. With most short-term job readiness training and rapid placement programs, abuse survivors are tracked into low-skill, low-wage work, jobs, that will, that jobs which generally offer no opportunity for career advancement or wage growth. Ms. Hayes, mm -hmm. if you could just pick one more choice paragraph. Sure. Uh, so I'll just jump down to the bottom. Um, so we know that these women, many of them EEP clients, many of these survivors, do remarkably well in service sector jobs ranging from healthcare technology to finance and law. And we know that helping them attain economic empowerment is a sound investment, particularly given that so many are single mothers bringing up the next generation of our city's children. Um, 
san uh, Sanctuary's vision for the future includes opening our career training program in other boroughs. There you go. That's what I'm looking forward to hearing <laughs> about. <laughs> Such as replicating the successful program NGBV has helped us to launch at the Manhattan FJC. It includes expanding the range of available career pathways to accommodate those clients for whom service sector office jobs may not be attractive or attainable. And it includes enhancing EEP's literacy offerings to provide more robust assistance with high school equivalency, college access, and English for speakers of other languages. All of these goals are attainable, but not without substantially more investment from the city. We're, shall I continue or? I think, we're, uh, thank you. Um, but can I just ask you a quick question? Sure, what do you think, what do you think is holding the city back from having a learning lab at all the FJCs. Is it a matter, are there boroughs where it's a matter of physical space, on-site physical space, um, or is it, you know, funding? Well, I, I don't have the inside track on that. I would imagine it, it took time for the lab to be built out at the Manhattan FJC, um, and then they had to kind of like commandeer space that was being used and they shifted people. So I would imagine that that is a barrier, but I'm not exactly sure what. Mm -hmm. I'd love to follow up on that with you, mm -hmm. but um, let's keep going and sure. You know what, you're, um, how about we do this? Come on up and, and just, say your name and it, it's important to speak into the microphone for the purpose of the record, our Bob transcript. From Sanctuary for Families. Uh, there were a couple things that worked together to make the Manhattan Center such a center to work on. Uh, one was the availability of the Manhattan District Attorney's Senior Campus Infection Initiative mm -hmm. funding at the same time. Um, and then with the fact that there was substantial more space at the Manhattan FJC, I know that at some of the other locations uh, it, it worked with people that were around them and you know, was a bring it in people again as they Thank you. We'll follow up. Hi. Uh, my name is Andrew Santa, and I'm the Director of Legal Services at Day One. I'm going to keep my comments brief, and since they're already written, I think I just want to respond to some of the things that were said and ask some, um, add a little bit to the conversation. Just for folks who don't know, Day One is the only organization in New York committing its full resources to dating violence among youth aged 24 and under. We work to create a world without dating violence by delivering a combination of services that include social services, legal advocacy for young survivors of relationship abuse, leadership development for teenagers, and preventative education for students um, K through 12. Uh, we've been around since 2003, and um, we have educated or assisted annually more than 18,000 youth under the age of age 24. Um, we work both inside and outside of traditional systems, but also within the courts, schools, with law enforcement, through partnerships with the DOE, and also, of course, with NGBV. And so where NGBV is at this access point between um, a bridging space between, let's say, the community and systems, we know that many systems and services are adapting to serve youth, but these systems were not designed with young people in mind. So with that said, a lot of, a lot of our services from courts to schools to case managers to attorneys to police to HRA to shelters, a lot of the work that we do is to transform those systems so that it can be more accessible to youth. So with that in mind, we're offering this testimony that focuses on our unique experiences of working with young survivors. We're an on-site partner at a couple of FJCs and we're an off-site partner for all of them. So with that, we're hoping to provide some valuable information towards this testimony. Um, so what that means is, and just truth be told, we're also working with NGB be pretty closely on a lot of these issues, so they're not going to be a surprise to anyone there. <laughs> um, so with that said, from initial appointments um, to regular visits, family justice centers should be an accessible point for young survivors. And I'm not sure other folks have raised this, but there's often this perceived um, um, concern about the actual accessibility or inaccessibility of family justice centers, they're, they are co-located co with district attorney's offices. So what that means is that for many folks, including young people, including doc undocumented folks, including LGBTQ survivors, including young people or, or clients generally who have involvement in the criminal legal system, that access point is um, 
is hobbled a little bit. It's a space where some folks have some questions about can I actually enter this space? And so what we'd offer to that conversation is that that also is presents problems for young people, right? So you can imagine for a young person going to a family justice center on a Metro card or wondering if their parents are gonna be alerted if they go through security, things like that. So for thing, these are conversations that we have on an ongoing basis with the FJC because for a young person, right, who can conceivably be LGBTQ, be undocumented <laughs> and experience dating violence, um, we wonder about what it means for a young person or really any client to access these systems. What does it mean for a young person to create, to um, file a police report? Will they be taken seriously? What happens to the data that hap that is delivered? And so I know that that was uh, a little bit of a conversation about this here, through this hearing, but where does it go? Does it live in the city forever, right? So what happens with this? For young people, particularly in an organization that um, values the data of young people, what does it mean? Like, does this just exist in perpetuity, including somebody's age and name? Um, what legal protections are there to protect that data? And is it ever actually deleted, right? Um, other questions that we ask, um, I think, and again, we're in partnership with the FJCs and NGVV about this. Um, can young people visit the FJCs without their parents' knowledge? Or more particularly, in cases in which um, disclosing harm that they're experiencing their relationship um, to their parents or to the schools or to other service providers, can that cause more harm, right? So for anyone accessing the FJC. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. quick question. Sure. Are you saying that you don't have an answer to that question? I'm saying that these are questions that we've raised at the FJCs and we're working with them on those issues. So that is to say that... The but so yesterday someone came in, a young person came yeah. in, were they given a clear answer, whether they walked in in one borough or another, about whether or not that information, whether or not someone at the center is obligated to call the parent? Right, so th that actually is an active question, right? So I think okay. that to the extent we, and for us, I think, and, and again, this is often through partnership with the FJCs because I think, um, again, going back to my earlier point, these systems were not designed with young people in mind. And so there's an adaptive curve that happens as we make these spaces more accessible to young people. Legally, do you happen to know if they're required? So I think I could answer that from the perspective of, um, from the work that we do at day one. I certainly couldn't speak on behalf of the city or whatever their responsibilities are. At day one, I think, um, you know, because we often engage in a legal relationship with young people, that young person um, can't, is entitled to, you know, sort of confidential legal services, um, things like that. I think on other spaces, particularly for things like, let's say, therapy, there are other protections that could potentially protect young people, but I think on as it scales out to other community-based organizations in relationship with the city, those are still ongoing questions. Does that make, is that awkward? Yeah, that, thank uh, you for raising that. Sure, the other, and I, I wanna keep it quick, is I, I know that um, to the extent that there's also data collected, we know that there are many statistics um, that are often produced by NGBV and other partner organizations about um, the ages of people who are victims of homicide, right? And so to the extent that 26% um, of victims of homicide were between the ages of um, 16 to 29, you know, to the extent that there is information that we pull out about um, the ages of victims, that also can help us figure out how great the need is and where potentially resources should be directed towards younger folks. Um, you know, there was a, a report, maybe perhaps for another hearing, there's one report issued by NGBV in January 2019 that talked about the prevalence of stalking between, for that impact young people ages 18 to 24. That's another thing to look into, right? So when we think about how abuse manifests across um, ages and its disproportionate impact on young people, whether through cyber stalking or stalking in person, I wanna keep that, I wanna raise that to the attention of the, the council. That's very helpful. Um, just to quickly say, we've been joined by council member Brad Lander from Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Um, and are you, just to make sure I understood what you just said, would you recommend that they issue that report on an annual basis? I don't, I, I, I guess I wouldn't want to make, I would love for that to happen and I also want to be mindful of the resources requi <laughs> required to issue a report okay. on that annual basis. Thank you. Um, a yeah, if you could just finish up. Yeah, Thanks. sure. The other quick points that I want to make is that I, I know that this is a hearing on, um, on the work of the, uh, the, the of NGVV, but there was one thing that was issued in the report that I wanted to comment on, which is um, the conference summary of safety, accountability, and support, exploring alternatives to intimate partner violence. I just wanna briefly say that I, at day one, we firmly believe that the end of intimate partner violence includes accountability for the person who ha caused harm, but also a deeper conversation about the role that communities and family can play in the, uh, the elimination of all harm. We recognize that, um, 
that restorative practices might not be relevant for all survivors, but we recognize, particularly for in the intersections of youth, for um, communities of color, for LGBT communities, and for communities who have ne negative experiences of the criminal legal system, that, that there are practices um, that we can learn from around those issues. Um, so and to re reiterate and clarify, we believe that there are, um, there is a role for NGBV um, in the mayor's office and even government systems to play in helping bridge that space. But we also do not believe that, that, um, that we believe that there's a framework um, of, of addressing intimate partner violence that doesn't equate punishment as the exclusive form of accountability. And that's really important for us as the work we do with young people. And I know that there was, um, and lastly, I'll just say, I know that another piece of the agenda was to um, urge Congress to reauthorize VAWA, and we're here for that too. So thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal and council members. My name is Rye Walker, and I'm a policy intern at Girls for Gender Equity, or as we refer to it, GGE. Um, thank you for holding this hearing and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'll give an abridged version of the testimony that you thank have on you. record, just for time's sake. Um, we at GGE share a common goal with the initiatives today. Um, we are a youth development organization and advocacy organization. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, we're based in New York City and we're committed to this physical, psychological, and social and economic development of girls and women. Um, we are offering testimony today in order to ensure that this body and the general public understand how important it is to consider and work with young people, particularly young people of color, when reviewing the harms of domestic violence and programs to mitigate its prevalence. As many of you know, domestic violence is not abuse which solely occurs between or at the hands of adults, especially as you spoke to. Nationwide, 9% of female and approximately 6% of male high school students report having experienced physical dating violence in the last year. In New York City, the average is even higher. 12% of students report experiencing physical dating violence. Studies indicate that teen survivors of dating abuse are three times more likely to miss school due to not feeling safe, three times more likely to carry a weapon to school, and twice as likely to experience bullying in school. These behaviors are characteristic of a process called school pushout, a term coined coined by Dr. Monique Morris, and it describes how girls and non-binary youth often lose out on educational opportunities because of system failures, including school-based sexual harassment. As an organization which directly works with young people, and being a 20-year-old myself, I understand how imperative it is to recognize the many ways young people are implicated in domestic violence so it can be comprehensively addressed. GGE has been a leader in a conversation around gender-based violence, including sexual harassment, abuse, and dating violence for close to two decades. With the allocation of funding for full-time Title IX coordinators, we, we in the city celebrate a huge victory for our youth. We thank the council members for seeing the necessity and taking concrete steps toward making schools sp safer spaces, ones more adequately able to address dating violence. We have been an advocate for a comprehensive sexual health education, which includes topics such as consent and dating violence. If sexual health education is not taught in this way, rape culture and similar gendered assumptions and the negative st stereotypes of male and female sexuality continue to be perpetuated. We are given a unique opportunity in the classroom to execute preventative programs and kickstart generational cultural change. I hope this continues to be recognized in the city's work. I also want to speak quickly to VAWA um, when calling for resources to be allocated for the protection of women from sexual, domestic, and intimate partner violence. Many organizations at the forefront of VAWA historically ignored the threat that law enforcement presents for cis and trans black girls and women, GNC communities, Native American girls and women, immigrants, and sex, work sex workers who long experienced harm at the hands of law enforcement and other state actors. VAWA's annual allocations appear primarily as grants to coalitions with a great deal of those resources going to police departments and prosecutors offices. These investments fail to recognize how law enforcement and prisons operate as added sources of sexual violence for people of color within the US. Our hope is that anti-violence organizations which look to alternatives to incarceration and criminalization will be lifted up in any resources to domestic violence on the city, state, and federal levels. In addition, we look forward to continued commitment to prevention and education. We thank the council, and in particular, the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for the opportunity to share our work and look forward to continue to support as we serve all New Yorkers together. Thank you. Um, you know how much I love your organization, <laughs> so thank you for always being here. Um, we're, we're gonna follow up offline on a couple of the issues that were raised today. 
Thank you so much for coming to testify. I'm going to call up the next panel unless Councilmember Lander. Uh, no, just thank you guys for all your work and for being here, and thank you to the chair for convening this important hearing. Right, well, I'd, I'd uh, be honored to be added as a co-sponsor to this important resolution. Thank you for bringing it forward. Um, next, I would like to call up Myrtle Reagan from the Women's Center for Education and Career Advancement, as well as Mary Luke from the UN Women Metro New York City. And power up. You're welcome to start. Oh, thank okay. you. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, as you know, UN Women um, is really such a, a strong advocate and um, really symbolizes the importance of women's economic empowerment as well as political participation and violence against women. So I'm here to speak on behalf of the intersectionality of all of these issues and as a member also of the POWHER uh, Board of Directors. So it's really, um, you know, I, we're, we're just so pleased that the Commission has really taken this approach of joining the issues of ending uh, gender-based violence and economic empowerment. This is being done, I think, in a very unique way uh, not only for the city, but also for the state and for the country. And I think that the lessons that we learn from that are going to be very, very useful um, as we really enter you know, the next decades. So I think it would be wonderful to see much more documentation about the um, interrelationship between these issues. It would be wonderful to see the economic empowerment programs growing in the data that you know we've seen in the reports. And as we enter, as the UN enters the uh, 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action, it would be wonderful if we could see some stories from the city and data from the city that really speaks to the issue of the linkages between these issues. Um, uh, finally, I, I really want to commend um, you on and uh, now Brad Landers for your resolution uh, to have the city pass the uh, Violence Against Women Act. It is so important that this country, the Senate and the President takes a stand on ending domestic violence and gender-based violence. So we appreciate your, your efforts in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Merble Regan. I'm Executive Director at the Women's Center for Education and Career Advancement. I also want to thank the Women and Gender Equity Committee of the New York City Council for this opportunity to speak briefly about the current economic status of working age women in our city. I want to thank also the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. Over the decades that our center helped thousands of women to prepare for further education, jobs, and careers. We learned that full-time jobs in New York City didn't always mean that they were earning enough money to meet their family's most basic living expenses. For four decades, we made the case for economic empowerment of women as a key factor in the well-being of New York City working families. For more than 20 years, we provided com comprehensive services for New York City displaced homemakers, the majority of whom were victims of ongoing domestic violence. The intersectionality of economic empowerment and domestic violence informed the range of services that the Women's Center provided to thousands of New York City women. Since 2000, we've partnered with other human services agencies to define exactly what incomes New York City working families need to earn to make ends meet, depending on where they live in New York City and the ages of their children. 
Also, I want to announce that I'm a newly elected board member of Calvary, New York. <laughs> um, which families in our cities are working and can't afford the basic necessities? More than 2.5 million New York City men, women, and children and working families, many headed by women, who are experiencing economic distress on a daily basis are routinely overlooked and undercounted. We have attached to this testimony sample self-sufficiency budgets. Note that these budgets, these are break-even budgets. They do not include extras such as vacations, emergency, college, retirement, or other savings, food from outside the home, credit card or loan payments, and many other things the rest of us take for granted. We are encouraging the city council when we work toward economic equi equity and empowerment for women and their families to think not just about moving families above the poverty level. For a family in New York City of four, rising above poverty means that that family earns $28,000 a year for four people. $15 an hour provides an income of about $30,000 for a family of four. We all know wherever you live in New York City, that's not enough money. If you take a look at the two budgets, sample budgets that we included, one is for an adult and a school-aged child. The other is for two adults and two school-aged children. In general, $15 an hour does not support any family of any size in New York City. So we encourage the city council, and actually the government of New York City, including the mayor. When we think about women's equity and empowerment, let's think in terms of how much money it actually takes to make ends meet. We have calculated self-sufficiency budgets for over 700 family types in seven diff different parts of New York City. So we have Northwest Brooklyn, the balance of Brooklyn. We have Queens, we have Staten Island, we have the Bronx, we have North Manhattan, and we have South Manhattan. The reason that it is 700 plus family types in each geographic area is that we make a distinction among ages of children. For women in particular, women-headed families, whether you have an infant, a preschooler, a school age, or a teenager, determines how much money you need for each aspect of your budget. So we encourage uh, public policy makers, educators, trainers to think within the context of what's reality based for New York City. Um, since you've distributed my testimony, I'm not going to go over all of the details and the findings. We have seven um, different briefs in our most recent economic self-sufficiency um, reports. As I said, we, you know, we worked with thousands of women over the years. We placed them in jobs and thought, great, we've done a terrific job. They came back to us, and what they said is, I'm having trouble managing credit. Can you help us with financial education? We did the research. We worked with hundreds of women, and what we determined is that they were not abusing credit, and they were not abusing the income that they had. They were working in full-time jobs which did not support them and their families, which is how we came in the year 2000 to try to figure out how much money do people need to earn to make ends meet in New York City. So I'm gonna skip over the findings and say that we have since the year 2000 generated reports on what it actually costs to live and work in New York City. The most recent report is the fifth one, and you can see what we've, uh, through what has been distributed, that we worked on the data for a year and a half for this most recent report. After that time, we collaborated with the 32 community-based and human services organizations on the back of each brief to determine what public policies would help most to help our low-wage working families in New York City who are not earning enough money. They represent um, over 900 fam 900,000 families in New York City. And so 
We worked with our colleagues from these 32 agencies to develop a series of public policy recommendations, which you'll find in this key findings and recommend, uh, recommendations brief. We looked at specific characteristics, the public policy changes that would be most impactful in increasing income, those would be, that would be most powerful in reducing major non-discretionary cost, those that would reach a broad audience, inclusive of, tr of traditionally marginalized New York City populations, those that would advance coordinated and interconnected solutions, and we look for policy changes that have already gained traction legislatively and or have established public support. So specifically, I mean, there are lots of them here in this document. I'll just talk about two that relate to the women that we're most concerned about in this uh, testimony. One would be to increase wages to align with the true cost of living. The cost of living in New York City, since we've been doing these reports in the year, since the year 2000, have increased three times the rate of wage increases. And so we mm -hmm. think that's an, so people are doing the right thing, working hard, earning money, getting incremental increases, but the cost of living has increased three times that much. So we need to address the reality of their lives. Um, I won't go over the thank yous that I was gonna make uh, on behalf of all of us for the state and city mm -hmm. progress that we've made over the last four years, except to say that I think this is an uh, important time in which the city and the state can be aligned on um, enacting some really progressive and consequential legislation. And so we encourage everybody to use the data. This is very exciting reading for your summers on the beach and every place else. Um, you can go to the uh, website that's listed here and you can do a number of things. You can put in a client family's actual budget and income. And you, can, you will see what that family's break-even self-sufficiency budget is. Um, you can look at different parts of Brooklyn or the Bronx and see where the need is greatest. Um, you can play with your own uh, budget. One of the things that we we have over the years trained over 5,000 city workers to use our self-sufficiency calculator, which as it says at the end here, in less than five minutes, you put in a client family's or your own income and budget, and it will tell you whether you are now working at a deficit or a surplus. It will show you which benefits that will supplement wages or reduce expenses you might be eligible for and the impact on your budget, and it will give you your self-sufficiency income. So I will just say on behalf of some of you here in the audience that as we have done this work, I said we've trained over 5,000 people to use our calculator. Um, they represented over 500 nonprofit organizations. At least half of the staffs of those organizations ran the calculator on for themselves and their family and said, I am working in a job that pays me so little that I am going into debt every month. So that's another session about people who work for human services organizations, mm -hmm. but it is relevant to the women that we want to protect through the work that's being done by this particular city agency. And then there's a little box at the end which says, that we have a new self-sufficiency calculator. It will be open source, which means that any agency, any organization can take it at no cost, customize it for their client base. It was developed as open source because we did not want people to make money from it, but we wanted them to be able to use it. And council member Ben Kalos was one of the initial funders for this project. So we'd like to come back in the fall and demonstrate that for you. It takes about three minutes. Game on. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for your hard work. It's extraordinary. And um, we'll be coming back. Okay. And with that, is there, are there any other? Okay. Um, and with that, this hearing is called to an end. Thank you. Thank you.